This is the St. Charles History Chronicle, episode 2401. Professional magician and St. Charles' own, Terry Evanswood joins Eric and Steve at the microphones to talk magic, growing up in St. Charles, and digitizing videotapes. Brought to you by the St. Charles History Museum in St. Charles, Illinois. Hey everybody, this is Steve Gibson, past president now of the St. Charles History Museum. We're back today with our podcast. Haven't been around for a while. I hope you didn't forget about us. Um, I'm here today with uh, Eric, of course. Good afternoon, everyone. And another special guest, uh, Terry Evanswood. Um, welcome, Terry. Abracadabra. <laughs> Terry, as you uh, probably know, if you've been to St. Charles any amount of time, is uh, I'd, I'd like to call him our like house magician, but you don't live in St. Charles. So you're from St. Charles. I am. Actually, I, my parents moved me here on my first birthday. And uh, it was kind of interesting story in itself. I was the only kid I know of who got three birthday cakes on his first birthday. With the move, my mother, of course, had planned a little something. The neighbor did because they didn't think I was going to have a party. And then my grandmother did the same, thinking that my parents were too busy. So oh, uh, <laughs> it was a good start. And on June 17th, my parents moved to St. Charles and I've been here my whole life until I moved to Pigeon Forge because of the show. Oh, okay. Fantastic. Yeah. One of the things that, that everybody kind of talks about is the fact that you started this like, um, by the way, I'm friends with Steve Martin, <clears throat> who's also been on our podcast. And Steve was telling me that he was working with the JCs when you were just getting started with your career. And I, I find it amazing. I think you were, what, nine years old or something when you decided you wanted to be a magician? Right. So my parents gave me a Marshall Brodeen magic set for Christmas. So all of you in the Chicagoland area know very well the name Marshall Brodeen. Mr. TV Magic. Amaze your friends with 10 easy tricks. And the, the magic <laughs> team kids. He also, uh, unbeknownst to a lot of people, uh, might not r realize that he was Wizzo. He played Wizzo, the wacky wizard on WGN's Bozo Circus show. And that made a huge impression on me. In fact, Wizzo used to kind of scare me when he'd come out. Do I have something? <laughs> um, but That's what was, my mom used to say, too. It really? <laughs> yeah. It was um, but it, a fun character. So with this magic set, I took to it right away. I had, I had, of course, at nine years old, I hadn't had much experience in other interests. But I knew I wasn't great in sports. I wasn't the best academically. I, You know, there was no particular music or there was no particular uh, venue or area that I wanted to uh, pursue at that point as a kid. But this magic set, holy cow. I think the reason that I had so much fun with it from day one is because the reaction you get from other people. It was something that, that was rewarding for me. I enjoyed doing, and I loved how other people felt when I was doing what I was doing. So I ended up putting together little magic shows in the garage for the kids in the neighborhood and in Wasco, uh, Burning Tree Subdivision, and uh, Long Shadow Lane. That was home for a long time where it all started. So from the magic set, my father noticed how much I enjoyed it, and he happened to see an advertisement for Blackstone, Harry Blackstone Jr. He was the greatest magician when I was a kid, uh, America's foremost magician. And lucky, uh, my dad decided on his Wednesday off at the state bank down by the river, he thought, I'm going to take my son to the magic show, and I bet he'll love it. Well, that was an understatement. <laughs> <laughs> Changed your life, did it? It really did. So um, my grandfather and you actually have rather similar stories. Really? My grandfather was a magician as well. Oh, uh, wow. He was the great Andre. He partnered with his brother. They were Roy and Ken Matson. They were more local, but they toured around the world and did with, stuff like... With the dog. Yes, with the I'm dog there. Very familiar with Oh, my God. Absolutely. I have film footage of your grandfather. <laughs> oh, that is wild. It is actually legendary uh, in the Chicago area. Oh, my and God. Many appearances on WGN and very well respected in the magic community with a very uh, special, unique act uh, that was specific to him. And that's really been the um, the kind of the signature method of success in magic is having something different and unique. Magic is the oldest form of entertainment, even predates music and dance as an organized event uh, depicted on the, the, um, the walls and the pyramids it goes away. The cup and ball trick, which ironically was one of the tricks in the Marshall Bernie magic. <laughs> yeah. So the, the point being to be different, uh, to be noticed, to be recognized in magic, take something special. And your grandfather is one of those. 
Oh, that's fantastic to hear. I honestly did not expect that. So, yeah. I was at your show, and I thought one of the things that I really appreciated was the fact that you started with that little capsule video of, of your history here in St. Charles. Um, even though the people in that place know it, um, everybody could kind of identify with it then, right? We all have these memories of the things that, you know, St. Charles means to us and stuff. And I think it's it had to um, inform your life, you know, to be here in St. Charles. I, I can't, you know, the coolest thing is to me to be a little kid, to make a decision like you did, and then get lucky enough to find the support from there on to do right, that stuff. Right. You know, not having somebody going, yeah, you'd be a magician, but, you know, front end alignment's really the way you, you want to start here. You know, uh, you mentioned luck. Uh, Jeff, Jeff Orland, who's a longtime barber here in St. Charles across the street, Avenue, Avenue 2, he, uh, he told me once I was sitting in the barber chair and I was talking about luck, and he said, you know, Terry, the, the harder you work, the luckier you get. And so I always think of that and credit him for that. Because it's true. Uh, we have to have some luck in our lives, but really you, you, you position yourself to be in a place to be blessed with luck. Uh, so I totally agree. I've been uh, just so blessed to have incredible support from home, first of all. Uh, my father, you know, being a businessman in St. Charles his entire career, uh, for a suit and tie guy to say, you want to do what? When you grow up, you know, I, I want to be a magician. He's like, well, you sure you want to? <laughs> uh, but what was amazing is as soon as he was convinced that that's what I wanted to do, he said, is that is that what would make you happy? And I said, oh, yeah, you have no idea. And he said, well, that's what I want you to do. Oh, well, that's fantastic. And he uh, totally supported my career. And in fact, he helped immediately with marketing. I'll never forget, I came home from school one day and there was a little box on the table and he said, open that. And it was a, a box of uh, business cards, Magic by Terry. And I thought, oh, my God, I've arrived. Yeah. I mean, I saw the first time I saw my name in print. It was very exciting. My mother had seen an advertisement uh, that David Copperfield was going to be on television. And she watched this interview. And he mentioned that that's how he started doing birthday party shows for, for kids in his neighborhood. And one thing led to another. So I went door to door like a salesman and knocked on the door. And, hey, I'm Terry. I do magic show. If you have a birthday party, let me know. And sure enough, a couple neighbors uh, uh, bit that uh, bait, and I started performing magic. And you do one magic show for kids. There's 12 kids there, and they want the magician at their parties. So pretty soon it was outside of Wasco and into St. Charles, and I really thought I hit the big time performing for uh, uh, you know the Sunday socials and the community events here, uh, Scarecrow Festival and all those things gathered and, and built a reputation and um, kind of get the ball rolling for bigger events. Oh, yeah. I'm, I actually uh, just did a newspaper search, and I've got uh, Scarecrow Competition. I've got uh, Duck Creek Plaza. I've got Kane County Fairgrounds. You did Kane County. I've got uh, all sorts of, of your promos that you do over the years. As a magician, and especially you you got a very classy act. I mean, you really do a... You know, you're you're putting out a, a professional level performance when you're doing it here today. Obviously, it's been your career or life. But Thank you know, when I look back at these photos of you and see how you were, you know, holding yourself way back when, I just full force, no questions, no turning back. You know, and I I, I do look back at that and think, how does a nine year old kid know what he wants to do with his life? But I kept my my uh, blinders on and stayed in my lane and just kept pushing forward. And let me tell you, it's not, it was not an easy career choice. Uh, in fact, once in a while I have a parent after the show come up and see, you know, my introduce the son or daughter who says he wants to be a magician and, you know, I'll pull the parent aside and just be honest with him. Um, I, I can't full out recommend, here's a good idea. Take this kid and throw him to the world of magic or any form of entertainment at that age with the um, with the concept that this is what they're going to do with their career, I I'm, I don't want to step on any dreams, but I'm just being honest. It really was so much work, so much energy, so much money, support from home, from the community, agents and representatives, and it just it takes a lot to get to the point where you could make a living with it. Uh, a, a magician friend of mine who's written a lot of books, a historian on magic. He said uh, something that's always struck with me. He said, survival 
as a magician, survival is a triumph. And how true. Uh, I've been very blessed and just kept working and, and I've been able to make a, a living with this. Uh, my recommendation to kids now is get get a degree, get a solid you know career path, and if you can make it as a magician, God bless you. Uh, which is ironic because it's exactly opposite of what happened with me. My father said, where are you going to college? And I said, I'm not going to college. He said, no, you are going to college. Uh, you have to have a backup career if this magic thing doesn't pan out. And this was my logic. I had thought about it. He thought I came up with this on the cuff, but I have this <laughs> argument ready. And, and the point was, Dad, if, if I have a backup career, that's what I'll fall on when things get rough. If I don't have any other talents, abilities, knowledge, I will have to make this work. And that's what I did. When you were nine years old, what were you going to be, Eric? This is going to be silly, but I, I had that similar passion and drive as you did, Terry, but for museums. So <laughs> wow. There was, awesome. uh, I knew I just wanted to do something with history and be there with the artifacts. So the That's same exact fantastic. passion thing. And my parents, same exact thing. My dad, an accountant, totally opposite of me and a business type. And he's like, Go ahead if it's your passion. He's like, it doesn't matter how much you make if you're doing it. it yeah. It's rare to find a kid of that age who'd have a respect, understanding, or appreciation of the past yeah. in history. I never did in school, uh, and now I look back and think, how I, how couldn't I? Yeah. I mean, I'm just passionate about the past and trying to recreate things from the past, as you saw on the yeah. show. That's awesome. Yeah, a lot of that goes back to my grandfather as okay. well and the whole act and stuff, and then his whole life is in boxer and then dog act and coast guard and everything in world war ii so just hearing those stories and there's a connection i felt and you know it just kind of led me on to that passionate path where i'm like i know this is what i want to do i know i'm not going to make a lot of money doing it but this is what i love so yeah that's awesome totally can relate to that it, it, it is and, it, and you mentioned the history part of it um and i think that's one of the things when i heard that you wanted to come and see the museum and you wanted to come and talk to us i thought well that's one of the cool things in your show that you talk about history a lot. But I also think it's um, there's a lot of magic in history. I mean, just the fact of knowing history, is, as Eric can tell you, yeah. it, a lot of people think of it as magic. How do you know this? Where did you learn all this? How does this, you know, and it's really um, only by being completely immersed in it that you really get to that level of being able to kind of off the cuff recite things and do things. And, you know, people say that to me, how did you learn history? I've only been involved with St. Charles history for maybe 10, 12 years. Okay. That's, but in the meantime, I've worked on projects that have had me, you know, working at minute details and dates and things like that, that, that helped me, you know, make a complete picture. And basically um, the thing that I always talk about here is I want to put everything in context. I, I think history right. is best when it's in context. Absolutely. And I think, and, and again, not to make everything about your show, but you do the same thing with your acts. Okay. You are putting everything in context, which is what makes it fun. Um, and in fact, even when you started the show this time, you were kind of preaching to us about relax tonight, enjoy yeah. the magic. Okay. Right. You know, this is not a thing where we're all trying to do a gotcha thing. This is a, have a fun time tonight. Sure. Get into the moment. Sure. You know, first of all, let me tell you, I, I appreciate and respect what you do because I can compare it to you. You're, you're kind of like detectives, yeah. you know, you're piecing together parts of history, specifically here, St. Charles to paint a picture, to be able to share with people. And I really, I really believe no matter what our age, we can't understand or appreciate the present if we don't first have a respect and understanding of the past. Um, and that's one of the trends that I think is a problem in our current society with younger people where it's just about the now, uh, in the moment. And, uh, that's disappointing to me because I, I really think our lives are much richer when we have, uh, a love for history, family history, your hometown, your country. Uh, and then specifically in our interests, like for me, magic, I've been collecting antique magic, but we're, I was so lucky that, um, the King County flea market was right here, 10 minutes from, you know, where I grew up. And so, um, the first Saturday of every month, my dad would say, we're going to flee to the flea <laughs> to find things we didn't know we couldn't live without. <laughs> and once in a while I find a magic trick oh, and then I really started yeah. looking and pretty soon there were historical items about magic, and that really piqued my interest. 
and it I, it got so obsessive. I had a T-shirt printed that said "I collect magic" on the front and back in case I missed something, and a dealer spotted me. Say, "Hey, I got a book on Houdini or whatever." And so I amassed a pretty extensive collection of magic memorabilia, antique props, and per, you know paraphernalia, costumes, autographs, uh, you name it that formed a pretty good sized collection that's now on public display that's in my home. Uh, that's a public house tour, which we'll talk about. Yeah. Cool. Oh, that's so cool. It's doing what we're doing over here. <laughs> right. So, yeah. Yeah. And that's, that really, the fun of it is, um, to be able to make the story complete for someone, you know, um, to, you know, somebody will come in and ask Eric a question about something and he'll put it into four paragraphs of a story, you know, that, that, that only comes from having the full picture in front of you and being, being able to see it. Because the thing we're kind of blessed with being in the museum is we can just sit there and dig through this stuff. I mean, kind of, you were reminding me of something. When I was a kid, nine years old, um, I loved surprising adults. I loved reading a book and reading something in a book. We had the whole set of Funk and Wagnalls up on the shelf in the in the dining room, of course. And I loved reading something and then saying it to my 80-year-old grandmother and saying, you know, yeah. and she'd be like, no. And i go, there, here it is, grandma. It's right here. This is what it is. And that surprising adults is a big thing of why, like, I enjoyed reading so much. That's, I'm sure, why you liked magic. It, at your age, you could walk up to an adult and do this, okay? And, Absolutely. And they would just lose their mind, What you know, that you could do that. And the same thing with you with history. When an adult comes to you and you say, I know history better than you do, and I'm nine years old, um, that, those are all surprising things. And I think, I, I hope that the message gets through to kids that Find that thing, okay, at, at that age, and then maybe you, maybe not. Maybe you won't be a historian when you grow up. Maybe you won't be a magician, but find that thing that kind of gets you to, to surprise people, and that's not a bad career to find, whatever it is, because we, we meet people like that all the time. They're like, I wish I'd stayed in history. I love history so much, but they've had fun doing other stuff. Sure. And, you know, you talk about the, the uh, element of surprise and what that brings to the person, and then you're rewarded because of it. And as I look back over my life and think just about everything I've done was about the response that it got from a person or a reaction and whether that's performing magic or, you know, we started the haunted house project here, uh, yeah. haunted manor that ran for, um, 15 years or so. It was in the Charlestown mall, right? It started at the St. Charles. Mall. Oh, the St. Charles mall. Yeah. That's what it was. The uh, Kmart mall, yeah. we call it when I was a kid. <laughs> That's what it, it was. It started yeah. there, um, that was there the one year, I think believe and then eventually moved to the charlestown mall and i love to watch the reaction it wasn't really about scaring people as much as it was just getting a reaction i love that as a yeah. kid by the way so and all, you were there <laughs> oh yes did you, <laughs> yes. you remember that oh yes that's amazing because <laughs> you know i think that people have forgotten about that and true story I'm in Pigeon Forge between shows, and I had to get a curtain for one of the props. So I walked in. We had a Joanne Fabrics that had just opened, and I, I walked in, and the woman uh, behind the counter, she says, uh, you you produced The Haunted House in St. Charles. And I said, what? What? <laughs> and I just, I was just floored. <laughs> How would she know that? And she didn't know that I was a magician. She didn't know that I was performing in Pigeon Forge. She recognized me because the haunted house. And it just made me feel so good that so so thank you, Eric. Yeah, of course. Oh the my god. How could I not? Yeah. Uh, and it, it, so it was about the reaction that I saw people have and um whether it's fear or laughing or you know whatever the response is wonder and the awe that you get watching magic. And now that's carried out into my home. You mentioned 1840. I was very fortunate to acquire the oldest house in my county, yeah, Cedar yeah. County, Tennessee. That's fantastic. Oh, it was Rachel Tennessee. It was 1832, and it was completed in 1840. Uh, John and Mary Ellis had a 400-acre uh, farm, and this home was the centerpiece. And it, uh, the walls are four bricks thick. Uh, we found the uh, wonderful treasures, uh, metal detected in the yard, horseshoes and pony shoes and farm implements. And But um, any, the long and the short of it is now it's open for public house tours because I love history so much. So I can share the history of Sevier County, the, you know, the specific house, and, uh, and also my magic collection that's there, the antique magic collection. And 90% of the contents of that house were all treasures found at the King County Flea Market. Mm -hmm. That's great. Oh, that is honestly so cool. Yeah. Well, that's 
I'll tell you now, this is how I first heard about you, okay, was through your work with Morrow the Magician, okay? And um, Would we have something to do with that? Yeah, a little, maybe a little yeah, bit. Yeah, yeah for sure. And, and, what was interesting was we we do a Grave Reminders tour. Um, we used to do it every year. Now we do it every other year. It's going to come up this year, hopefully. And um, I've just been working on all the scripts for that and everything else. And it's it's really interesting because as I'm going through all this stuff, I got here after you had done your work with Morrow's Gravesite, okay? So I saw what you had done with it, and I'm like, okay, so why are those rabbits at the, the haste thing, you know? And then learn the, the story about behind Morrow and everything. But the story, um, and I'll let you tell the story because you had to do the research to do it, but the story is another one of these kind of cool things about St. Charles. Like, you don't, how does all this happen to St. Charles? How how did this end up in this town that we, we had this thing happen? I mean, I don't know, do you remember the name Lillian Russell at all? Does that name, it's an old, old, she was, a, she was kind of the Lady Gaga of her time, okay? And she actually went to New York and became a very famous singer and everything else. And this is back at the turn of the century, Victorian era, okay? And um, it turns out that she used to summer here because her grandmother lived here in town, yeah. And we had the hardest time finding her because her grandmother's name was Von Aim, V-O-N-A-M-E, and it had been misinterpreted as Von Name. So when you went looking, you couldn't find it. But anyways, if you can, take us back to how you found out about Morrow and, and why you got involved in that and and talk about well you know you hit the nail on the head it was about the um the grave reminder tour that was um it must have been early on because actually you know what it was the first year when i was building as i was building the haunted manor at the saint charles mall the call came in from the the uh, museum that this was happening and asked if i would play the part of morrow and i'm thinking morrow who who is morrow you don't know Mar- Morrow is the famous magician that's buried in North Cemetery. It's like, you didn't know that? It, it was the first time I had been introduced to him. Okay. So, uh, so I was more than happy to play the part, and the museum had some uh, files on Morrow that I could do some studying and find out the type of personality he was, what his dress of the day would have been, specific tricks that he did, so I could put together an act to perform out uh, for the cemetery walk. <laughs> and I was so excited to do that. And, um, yeah, so these groups would walk up, and I would introduce myself as Maro and present the tricks that he would have done at the time, which was a unique way of doing it, you know, because I could actually present something more than just uh, talking about him. And I was told and saw the pictures, which Eric has been kind enough to give me a copy I'm looking at, of a picture of a team of horses pulling a huge boulder uh, through St. Charles. And the story was Morrow had a property in Leland, Michigan. That was his home area, a beautiful home built that was kind of a a treasure in the magic uh, industry. Even Houdini came to visit Morrow's home. There was a huge three-ton boulder in the front yard. And Morrow had told his wife, Allie, that when his time came, he wanted to use that as a marker for his gravesite, and because of his um, his love of Saint Charles and and having found his future wife here uh, from touring, he was on tour and had a stop in Saint Charles and ended up staying for quite a while and uh, fell in love and they were married and ended up retiring in in Leland, Michigan until his early death, but. That um, promise was kept. Um, she had that stone uh, transported by rail to Geneva. Geneva, the team of horses, picked it up and tried to drag it up twenty. What's now twenty five? I mean, it's amazing that they were able to accomplish this at that time and uh, place the stone. Now, here's the interesting thing about this: when I was performing there that day, I went to find this six foot tall boulder. There wasn't one. Uh, there was a Kaiser family plot, which was his wife's maiden name. So I knew I was in the right spot. And then it hit me, you know, th- this was the monument, but it's tipped over or been pushed over. Uh, and there was, cause there was no nameplate on the stone. And then I started thinking about it in between. I'd sit on that rock in between groups coming through the cemetery walk. And I thought, you know what? His nameplate is face down with mm-hmm. mud. Yeah. That's what's happened. And I made him a promise that if I ever had the ability, the whereabouts to do 
a, a, a restoration of the stone that I would make it happen. Well, you know, time passes, and we all make promises that sometimes don't come to pass. And there was no one waiting on me. It was just kind of a thing between him and I. And um, it, I couldn't get it off my mental rotation. This one year I was performing uh, at Wonderworks, uh, one of the attractions in Pigeon Forge. And it just it came over, I have to do this. I've got to make this happen. So the first issue was working with the the producer to take time off to be able to come up and do it and do it right. And uh, they were in full agreement when I explained the story. So long and the short of it is I came, I came up and with my brother's assistance, and he's been a stonemason, a very talented uh, stonemason in the area, did uh, all the stone work at Johnson uh, Statuary. The Sejuan wall, that huge stone wall, as you're coming at this, that was my brother's work. So he kind of engineered a plan, Dreesen Construction Company, uh, provided the uh, the truck, which you know I was going to rent from them, and when they heard the project, they said, "No, this is our part of it." Oh, uh, so the community cute. came together. This the museum, of course, and uh, some of the VIPs in the area. Steve Martin was there that day, which was fun because he's, he's such a he's everywhere. Yeah. Such a, a, hist- a student of history, yeah. especially this area. So um, we were able to get it done, and as that stone was being lifted. I saw there was a nameplate there and wiped the mud off, and there it was, Morrow. Okay. And uh, it was just, it still gives me chills. But here's the part that's amazing, too. As I was driving back to Pigeon Forge, I had seen in the research that Morrow had lithograph posters made. That was the type of printing that they did at that time. Very popular with circuses and sideshows, traveling performances, and magicians. Uh, because that was the only type of it. You're going back to a time, there's no social media. There's no radio, there's no television, no internet. You had to, to rely on printed material. The best way, you know, a picture says a, a thousand words, if you have a good picture, that's going to bring people to the theater. So that was the method of advertising. Well, these posters now of magicians are very collectible and, and expensive and real treasures if you can find one. There's some guys out there that just collect antique magic posters. So I, I knew there were Morrow posters out there, and I thought, well, you know, I should get one for my collection, hang in the house, share with people so I can tell the story. As you said, it's when you have a tangible physical object like you do here in the museum, it brings the, the story to life. It's one thing to tell the story. Storytelling is wonderful. But when you actually have an item, wow, then you're there. There's a connection. So I knew I had to find one. I got back to Pigeon Forge. There's a, a pile of correspondence in my mailbox at the theater. And among them, there's a, a letter from a guy uh, who said he lived in Leland, Michigan. His grandparents owned a home that belonged to a famous magician, Morrow. He summered there. When his grandparents acquired the house, they found posters under the staircase in the cellar. A complete set of Morrow's posters that were his. And... I thought, this is impossible. So I contacted the guy, and I told him what had just happened. He was totally unaware that this had just occurred. Yeah. It was just total coincidence, so they say. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> I don't believe in coincidence. Yeah. It was meant to be. So uh, I said, what do you want for the posters? And he told me this outrageous price. Uh, actually, prior to the story, when I told him the story of what just happened, he said, well... Th- these have to go to you. These are a gift for Morrow. And he gave them to <laughs> oh, me, wow. uh, along with a lot of Morrow uh, uh, documents, which I need to get you a copy of for the museum, and some other items. Morrow, as he traveled, he'd collect uh, ornamental knives from whatever country he was in. And they were all on display. One of the things that Houdini came to see, uh, tables like this, just tables in the front room of all these knives with pla- name plates of where they were carved from. <laughs> well, um, the man's uh, grandparents found a knife in the basement. And so he sent me that as well. And it's from India. And it's just so cool to have these personal, you know, items that came from this magician from my hometown. Oh my gosh, yeah. So, but then the punchline to all of this, which I thought of when you were talking, Steve, is um, Maro, when he died and was buried here, they had not... Um, place the stone 
when I heard the date that Mara was buried, it was close to the time that I was going to do the, the restoration. After the fact, I'm looking at these dates, looking at material I think I got from you that stated that Ali had the stone finally moved here two years after his burial. I look at the dates and realize the restoration of the stone was exactly 100 years from his burial. Yeah. Not how it was with the stone, but from his burial. Exactly 100 years. <laughs> it's wild. Yeah. It's just the whole thing. The was coincidences, major. coincidences, quote yeah. unquote. Yeah. Quote unquote. Yeah. Well, I'll tell you one thing that's easy to miss in this photo. Um, I, the, um, it's not a single wagon and and it's, it's not the boulder either it's, no, it's not right yeah. Yeah. It's no magic. it's a double team right and there's a board put between the two to hold the two trailers together and that's what the what the or two carriages together and that's what the stone is actually sitting on and they have to oh. i mean imagine what that's no, like to get I, I, two I different know. carriages running at the same speed there's and then my favorite part is there's like three guys standing up in the back of this th this whole thing. I mean, talk about a disaster waiting to happen. Right? Maybe yeah. Get, yeah. <laughs> you wouldn't you wouldn't get OSHA to agree to any of that today. I, mean, I don't think we we could barely get it done today. Yeah. You know, with the uh, heavy the, the heavy equipment, you know, this crane that came in, double lift straps were wrapped around the stone as it kind of edged off the ground, and one of the straps broke. I mean, and this is today's you know. Today is uh, uh, what we have the ability to do. I don't know how they did this, you know, in the early 1900s. At least. It, it, and what it says about you know, Mar we, what it says about Morrow to be a showman, okay, to think about this and realize that probably thinking about it 100 years from now, or what did you say, when, when did he die? 1908? 1908. Yeah, uh, 116 years from now, they're going to be talking about me because right. I put this rock yeah. in this cemetery yeah. here right. in the middle of St. John. I should say at the cemetery walk, I played Morrow three oh, years ago, really? so yeah, and I pulled the rabbit out of the hat trick, right, cool. you know, simple <laughs> stuff with one of my <laughs> grandpa's old, you know, can, you know awesome. pop up. Well, he kind of beat you. He pulled the rock out of the ground. Oh, that's oh, very wow. true. That's very true. <laughs> But I just want to say that the story and your part in the story is being retold as, you know, every That's generation, awesome. every time we have the cemetery thank walk out there. You. Yeah. Thank you for doing that. Are you kidding Probably me? It's a fantastic, I mean, it's just a beautiful thing that you did. So that was we amazing. appreciate that. Oh, I, I just, I'm so glad that that came to my knowledge. Um, I had never heard of him yeah. and it just all unfolded like most great stories do. Yeah. Well, that cemetery is full of them. Um, just as a little promo for the, when we do it, I just got done work, reworking 67 scripts for different characters in that cemetery. Um, we're really working on trying to add people that we didn't have before. And Eric's been working on a lot of different people, too. And it's funny how we're finding so many cool stories. You know, uh, uh, everything helps make the picture more real to people today. And I think the one thing, when, first, when I first got involved with the museum years ago, I didn't really know if I liked the idea. I'm not a big fan of ghost stories. It's kind of a, an, I, I don't, I do downtown walking tours and I always get the same question, which buildings are haunted. And, I, you know, in my heart, I would love to tell a story, but I'm afraid that I'm going to say, this is where little Joey Johnson jumped off the bridge. And every year at this time of year, somebody sees his ghost walking down the street only to find out that Joey Johnson's great granddaughter is in my tour going, what are you talking about? Joey never jumped off the bridge. It seems to me that it's a it's a very hard thing to, to do that kind of stuff. But the Grave Reminders Tour, we take it not as a scary thing, as you right. know. We took it as an opportunity to meet these people who you are not going to get to meet otherwise. And and um, I think that's one of the cool things about it is that we have this ability, and it's still a fun night out. You know, if we do it at sure. night, it's still scary to be in a cemetery. And the other, the other thing that I, I see that comes into play with what you're saying is there are people who believe in ghosts and people who don't. And if you, if you mix in a ghost story to that crowd, it, it just discredits everything that you're saying regarding other stories in history. And you want to be historically accurate. So I totally get uh, that you would not want to mix in theatrics yeah. uh, or hearsay into what you do. You're giving a factual if, account. Right. If you're doing a ghost tour and you're having fun with it and right. everybody, That's I was in Edinburgh in Scotland and it, as soon as it got dark out, every every doorway had some guy in a costume <laughs> ready to you know take you on a ghost tour of of, uh, of Edinburgh and 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 I mean that's fun and you know everybody's got a thing like but yeah that's literally that's kind of how I see it but so when I first thought about grave reminders I thought eh, and then now I see it 
And we have so much fun ha- introducing people to these people because, like you learn with Marl and other people in town, we've got a lot of pretty cool characters in this town when you when you think sure. about it. So, And you have a responsibility with the museum here that I totally respect in that nothing here is hearsay or legends. You know, you're dealing with, with hard facts and artifacts that that prove a story to be historically accurate. Yeah. Terry, I wanted to get a little more background on you, frankly, because I know you started out uh, here, then you moved up into the Bozo stuff, and then you were the youngest performer at the Magic Castle, I do believe. Uh, so how did you transition from moving in the Chicagoland area over to Los Angeles, and then how did you move over there to Pigeon Forge? Well, again, it's that whole concept of getting the ball rolling and, and the harder you work, the luckier you yeah. in these situations. So from St. Charles, you know, performing at community events and a lot of events at the King County Fair, yeah. uh, became acquainted with Marshall Brodine. And uh, he took a liking to me because I was doing a lot of the illusions that he used to do when he was my my age at the time. So he said, have you, have you been on the Bozo Circus show yet? And my heart's pounding. I think, well, no. And he's like, well, we need to get you on there. <laughs> <laughs> Holy cow. <laughs> you know, five minutes of WGN TV time. You know, for free yeah. as a, you know, 14 year old kid. And this is God. a dream come true. And Bozo, too. <laughs> yeah, meeting Bozo and, and Roy Brown, who played Cookie. <laughs> so, I mean, literally, we're hanging out, you know, with Bozo and Cookie, like on social events. And I, I remember thinking, this is so surreal. I mean, when you grow up watching the Bozo show, it's kind of a big deal. Yeah. I'm hanging out with these guys. And and pretty soon after I did, I think, like 12 or 14 appearances on the Bozo Show over the years. And um, whenever they did outside events, you know, fundraisers or parades or whatever, uh, they did uh, Bugs Bunny's 50th anniversary show at Great America. Oh, yeah. And yeah. Uh, and so they would ask me to do the magic in the, in the oh, show. Good idea. Then uh, Marshall had a show called Mysteries of Arobia. Doody, doody, doody. That was a big deal down at the uh, the Rialto Theater in Joliet, which was my birth town. And um, so they asked me to do the magic for that performance. So we became very good friends, and um, he had a lot of influence on my career. Some of the illusions that we still perform, uh, that, that I did at the Moonlight Theater, were specifically marshals that he gifted to my show. Oh, fantastic. So, uh, yeah great guy and great stories, great memories, yeah. but he was the one responsible to get me on to the Bozo show, which was incredible marketing. In fact, it was at that time that my father suggested you better pick a stage name. My legal name is Hoagie, H-O-G-E. It's not, it doesn't sound stagey. Uh, all the magicians uh, are stage names. Blackstone, his real name was Bhutan. Uh, uh, Doug Henning, David Copperfield. Copperfield's real name was Kotkin. And um, uh, these these magicians from the past who um, have to have a name, I get that when part of your identity is your name, kind of like a superhero. You got to have a title, a name. So the reason my dad had those business cards printed and just said Magic by Terry, because he knew he knew that one day I might want a stage name. So he left my last name off of it. So I had all these years to contemplate what would my last name be. Lucky for me, living in Wasco, taking the bus down Dean Street, heading to St. Charles. Uh, one of the first bus stops was the corner of Dean Street and Evanswood Lane. So the bus would stop there. And of course, so, I'm not thinking about my studies. I'm not thinking about what did I forget to, to study or finish to get to school. I'm dreaming about my career of magic. So I'm, you know, looking out the window every day and I see that sign and thought, hmm, Blackstone. Copperfield, Evans Wood, Stonefield Wood. It just seemed like Evans Wood. That's got a cool ring to it for a magician. So, you know, it was many months looking at that and contemplating. So, you know what? Yeah, we got to go with Evans Wood. So, my first appearance on, on the Bozo show, my dad said, you know, Bozo's going to introduce you. And do you want him to say Magic by Terry or are you going to have a stage name? Because this could be a branding. And, you know, three million people syndicator watching the Bozo Circus show. And so I, I, I told him we're going to go with Evanswood. So the very first time I was introduced as Terry Evanswood was on the Bozo show. I'd say it was a good choice. Yeah, it served <laughs> it's, me well. Yeah, it's definitely stuck and it's, oh my gosh, that's a cool story. So is that any video? This? 
survived? Yes, yes, and they have all of it. <laughs> I have. You're going to think this is an exaggeration, but being a, a history buff, you guys have to come down and visit. Oh, sometime. I would love to. I got family actually in Knoxville. My grandpa's sister, that one, actually lives in Knoxville. Oh, so we we've, really? we've been down okay. to Pigeon Forge once actually. Yeah, so, you know, yeah, see the show and see that. Oh, I'd love to see the house. I mean, it sounds wonderful. In the house are all the collections, as I mentioned, most of which came from this area. But um, being, you know, in the age when videotaping was first really a thing and you could have a, a home video camera, my dad filmed every show. We filmed every appearance on the Bozo Show. That is um, exactly what happened as with our travel. Opinion. It just continued. So the video collection became like, no joke, 1,500 oh, videotapes of my career from my first early uh, style of birthday party shows uh, in Wasco. And, and so every... Every facet of my life was documented. And since the advent of uh, DVDs and digital recordings, this is my point, no kidding, there are over 3,000 DVDs of my life. 3,000 DVDs cataloged, like you do here, yeah. where I can go to a date or a show That's so and cool. keywords to search something. To have like the footage that I found for the the Morrow introduction, the introduction of St. Charles in the second half of the show at the Moonlight Theater. Uh, okay. Yeah, so, so there was cool. a lot of back in the time. <laughs> oh, I know how much of a pain it is to get that all organized yeah, as well. Yeah, just the transfer of the oh, I was video say, Have you done the digitization? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I spent three years and burned through twelve uh, transfer machines oh to go gosh. from via, yeah, yeah, twelve burned out <laughs> from the yeah to oh, transfer all those. Videos. I was gonna say if you ever needed a hand with the digitization, but you got it under oh, control right. there. Like I, I do that. So, okay. yeah, it's well. That's one of the things that, that is so we're fantastic. always fighting here too is archiving. Okay, uh, being able to being able to get stuff in a place where you can find it later and to preserve it for the future. Because um, one of the first things I learned when I came here to the museum was how little we didn't appreciate newspapers. And they're all going to dust now. And, and you know, we've got lots and lots of newspapers upstairs, but you can't really, if you look at them, you have to be taking a picture of them because they're going to crumble as you, right. as you flip mm -hmm. the page. So very fresh. Um, and just not to get us completely off topic, but when you talk about DVDs and, and stuff like that, you know, the DVDs have a very limited time span too, right? Yes. So basically, Steve, what you're saying is I'm about to have to transfer <laughs> again, 3000 DVDs to another format. That is the uh, fun of keeping up here. <laughs> and then the fun of getting the old uh, materials to play the stuff, to digitize oh, yeah, it in the yeah. first place. Like right. uh, three-quarter Umatic inch or yeah. Umatic tapes that were broadcast. You know, you need to get yeah. a special, you got to get a Umatic player for that. So, yeah. yeah, it gets really interesting and fun. But it'll be a few decades down the line before okay, you have to right, go ahead with cool. that, though. I'll so. call you first. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'll gladly sorry. do it. Yeah, no. <laughs> sorry you mentioned. So you said three thousand. Holy moly! I've done a couple hundred, probably top. So there's 126 <laughs> photo albums uh, of printed photos, and oh, my God. Lord only knows the <laughs> amount of uh, my my media guy calls it uh, not terabytes it's terry bytes uh, it's just well, stacks of hard drives you're, you're all going to be beautiful down oh, there i mean gosh. oh my gosh yeah, yeah. Mm. you got everything to pull and oh sorry i'm geeking out over it i love it That's so awesome. yeah we have a lot of talking to you. yeah all right so we've covered a lot of uh, of territory here That's terry territory, territory. territory. <laughs> and uh You've been away from uh, Pigeon Forge for like well, how long? Now three weeks. It's Probably. been yeah, a little over a month. Yeah, so you got you got some catching up to do when you get back, right? I sure do. <laughs> um, it, you know, it was it was uh, bittersweet coming up here to do the shows, and it was on my leaving Pigeon Forge that I got word that my mother had passed. She uh, had been suffering from Alzheimer's for uh, dementia for eleven years, and it was about two years ago that. Uh, my dad made the decision to place her in a um, memory center facility that she could be taken care of, um, you know, more uh, with more ability than what he could do at home. He was—I can't believe how long he he took care of her every day for eleven. So um, that's part of the reason why I ended up here for the period of time that I did with to be with family and to catch up and i'm i'm so happy to have this opportunity to be a part of yeah, we appreciate you doing this i mean especially in your I, time of grief yeah. oh it's just well it's my pleasure and it's been uh, it's been a really it's been a blessing because what's incredible is i would never have the time 
I would have to, I would make time given the situation, but I would normally never have the opportunity to be away from Pigeon Forge for a month. Uh, but it happened to fall during our down season when the town really slows down and we would typically only be do doing shows on the weekends. So this, it was amazing timing. Yeah. Mom knew what she was doing. She, this was all timed and, and the ability to do the shows up here just really been an amazing trip. Oh yeah. I mean, it was a fantastic response from the community. When you came up here, you did a four night. We had a, how many nights did you have to add there? Well, we, we originally had <laughs> yeah. two shows booked and uh, the the show sold out in four days, and I couldn't believe it. Um, so they added a, a third show, and it sold out in four hours. <laughs> so another show was, and another show. We ended up with five shows. Oh wow! <laughs> uh, and in fact, the the operators of the Moonlight Theater, Nancy and Joe, said next year it just they're going to call it Evans Week. And just do a <laughs> be the house magician. That's a good one, yeah. And uh, yeah, from Pigeon Forge. So I want to tell you though how the whole Pigeon Forge thing started. Yeah, and, please. And why I ended up leaving St. Charles is something I never would want to do. But at some point, you have to be in a vacation destination to make a full time career out of entertainment, especially as a magician. So uh, up until that point, we were based here doing community shows, doing the Chicago Land thing. And, um, and then several agents started representing me for shows around the country, fairs, festivals, uh, corporate events, schools, colleges, just any, any type of show we could take, we would, it was kind of a shotgun approach of just any show that came across my desk. We would do it close up magic, which you referenced earlier for, you know, private parties on up to two hour stage illusion shows, wherever it was with the tigers and da da da. So, um, that's kind of where it was. And I finally thought, you know, <laughs> so, um, Tammy, my assistant at the time who had been with me for 21 years, by the time it was all said and done, she had been booking shows through these agents and keeping up with calendars, sometimes six, seven months in advance. And we looked at the calendar. And I said, okay, we're not booking shows any further from this date. And she said, well, how are we going to make a living? I said, well, now we have to. If that's our end date for the Chicago area, we've got to find something, find a permanent home. So we went to Wisconsin Dells, Myrtle Beach, Las Vegas, Orlando, Branson, any tourist destination that could support a full-time show. But we wanted to find a place where there weren't existing magic shows. And it's not that we're afraid of the competition. I just felt it would be unfair to go to a, a a community where a magician's already there making a living and step on somebody's toes. My career, you know, as far as that was concerned, was not as important. The integrity of being yeah. a, a good guy in the industry, I'm not going to step on somebody's toes. The other magician's code. That's it. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Number one, don't tell how you do your tricks. Number two, don't step on anybody's toes. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, you know, I couldn't think of a better place than Pigeon Forge, Tennessee. That's where my parents used to take us kids vacationing. Yeah. Uh, every year we go to Tennessee, Fall Creek Falls, Tennessee State Park, beautiful park, highest waterfalls this side of the Mississippi. Uh, less than two hours away was this magical town called Pigeon Forge. And at the time it was Silver Dollar City was the amusement park, which they have a sister park in Branson. That's, Silver Dollar that's City. What became Dollar or as my dad called it, Steal Your Dollar City. Uh, <laughs> and then became Dowelwood. Yeah, yeah, there we go. Really put the town on the map. <laughs> So I told Tammy, we need to go look around. And so we went there and started knocking on doors. There were 12 theaters and all of them were booked with 12 country music shows. There was no variety. And I thought, you know what, this is what we need to do. It's going to take some time. We're going to break into this market. So the only performance we could get was a morning show. So we did a morning magic show in a country music town. Here you have 12 nighttime country music shows. And here's this random you know, 10 o'clock in the morning magic show, our average attendance was eight people. Yeah. In a thousand seat theater. Uh, but I just said, this is going to work. And we just kept going. And the next year we had 20 people and it just little by little grew. It was not overnight. So I performed two years at Eagle mountain theater, eight years at country night theater, three years at magic beyond belief theater. That's when we had the tigers. Yeah, yeah. Then uh, I moved across the street to a larger venue uh, Wonderworks. I was there for 10 years. And now when COVID hit and all these changes happened in town, I moved to uh, Grand Majestic Theater where I am now. And uh, Saturday, a couple days away, 
uh, will open our 28th year, 28 years now as the longest running show in Pigeon Forge in a town where they told me a magic show would never work. Yeah. It was a country music town. And we've outlasted. Well, I, I, I was going to say, act. you were there before what Pigeon Forge has become as an entertainment capital of the yeah. southern United States, really. And you were there. I got it. Yeah. Really fantastic. 28 years. Pigeon Forge, I, I lived in Tennessee for a couple of years. We went there, uh, rented a beautiful home up in the mountains and, and had a great weekend there. But the funny thing about it, a little like Branson, is it's not a country it's not like disney world for country people it right. is an entertainment destination so i'm i swear to god everybody that goes there it goes there is probably going i've done this before i've done this before what haven't i done and to be the, the, the magician oh so, yeah okay is uh, you know i mean you know one of the big things there that, that i don't know if anybody in this area has seen it but we rode them is those like individual roller coaster things they got that you yes yeah we got a lot like, of those one at a time you know oh, yeah. you're kind of running down the coasters yeah you know. and you're like you you control the, the brakes and everything you know it's it, it you know I, I thought this doesn't seem like it's going to have a good ending yeah. if you yeah, put the right things together but that's the way that whole place is it's just a place to have fun in every dimension yeah, it's a mecca for family vacations yeah. You know, and and so perfect for me with the amusement parks and fun houses and carnival atmosphere, oh, and gosh, yeah. midway feeling. You know, great restaurants, beautiful resorts. And you're right this away. Is my pitch yeah. for you all to come, y'all. Listen to me. <laughs> I'm from St. Joe. Y'all come down to Pigeon Forge, <laughs> and uh, yeah. So uh, the the local joke is, uh, you know, after after 28 years and five different theaters, I I worked up one side of the the parkway and back down the other side and people say you know terry's not famous for his magic he's the only entertainer in the world touring pigeon for <laughs> <laughs> hey we we've, we've hung on i'd say you made a good so, career uh, out of that yeah uh, my show this saturday will be my ready nine thousand nine hundred and forty seven shows in pigeon forge so we'll break ten thousand shows in pigeon forge this year but that's not counting the the shows I had done for the year from when I was nine, my first birthday party, or nine until I moved to Pigeon Forge. So I know right now we're over ten thousand have magic is, shows. That is incredible. I can't believe it. That myself, is all. It's honest truth. So now you can like wow. in your sleep. Right? Yeah. It takes like no effort. You don't have to worry about anything. It's and just... it's funny you say that because I do it in my sleep. Last <laughs> night, no kidding, I woke up this morning. Last night, I had a dream that I came up with this great concept for this new illusion. We talked about having to be different, and, and I'd found this effect that I thought, you know, this is going to really blow people away. It was a, just an incredible idea. And I couldn't believe in my dream. I hadn't thought about it. But I woke up this morning. I'm thinking, it is the dumbest thing. You know, in your dream, how you think things are so wonderful. Yeah. I woke up. I was so disappointed. Oh, that was dumb. So are you coming back to St. Charles again? What do you think? Oh, absolutely. Okay. I can't stay away. Okay. I have my heart. My heart is here. Good. Well, if you're doing more shows here, let us know because we're, I mean, um, I, I, the community, you know, you say you saw how they responded to you, but I can tell you that the vibe that was happening as soon as people found out about it. And you know, the thing is, um, the, the St. Charles doesn't forget you, you know, they, they oh, like yeah. having you back here. So <laughs> that, that, that makes me feel so good because there was a comment that I don't know, I, I won't mention names, but there was, there was a comment that got back to me that, you know, Terry has been gone from performing in St. Charles. No one's going to remember him. <laughs> and I started believing that. And then when those shows were selling, I thought, oh my God, I just had tears and I was thinking, wow. Yeah. They haven't forgotten yeah, the no. And that's awesome. Yeah. No, and they won't, especially here. We always have pieces of you, uh, whether you like it or not. <laughs> no, <laughs> no it's so guys. funny for those yeah. listeners. I'm looking at the okay. table and there's kind of a splattering of pictures and newspaper articles. And, you know, sometimes if I go to someone's home and I see that, I think, okay, stalker, you know, <laughs> but, but here it's an honor. It's absolutely yeah, yeah. an honor to see this collection you're building of. Terry memorabilia. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So what is one of the more memorable or, you know, important moments you've had on stage that you could recollect, Terry? Well, I'll tell you, there, there's been a couple. Uh, one that it's a it's a very involved story, but basically um, probably the greatest thing that's ever happened in my career. Um, I was born on June 17th. Uh, exactly a year later on June 17th, Don McLean released the song, Vincent Song, which most people recognize as Starry Starry Night. Quickly became my mother's favorite. When I was designing the card act that you saw, the manipulation card routine, 
I couldn't think of a better song than my mother's favorite. So I, I created that as kind of a tribute for my mom. And now jump ahead. I've been doing that thousands of times in the show. So I, I think I've, well, I know, I don't think, I know I've heard that song more than Don McLean. Starry, starry night, twice a day, seven days a week for the last 28 years. <laughs> uh. So, um, uh, it really made an impression on me and, and it's become one of my standard, uh, there won't be a show where I don't do that routine. So this particular night we're performing at the, um, Magic Beyond Belief Theater, a woman came to the show and, and recalled this story for me. She had brought her daughter, single mom, brought her daughter to Pigeon Forge for what she knew would be their last vacation together. She had planned on taking her life on the Monday after that weekend. She felt she was an unfit mother and that if she was gone, her daughter would have a better life with anyone than with her. Uh, she brought her daughter to the brochure rack where you pick the things you might want to see or be interested in. And thankfully, her daughter picked the magic show. And so she said, well, we're going to go to the magic show then. So they went to the show that Saturday night. And in the show, here comes Starry Starry Night. And in that song, there's a suicide reference because the song is about Vincent Van Gogh. When no hope was left in sight on that starry, starry night, you took your life as lovers often do. So she heard that. She's thinking, how would there be a suicide reference in a magic show? So, so she started paying attention and kind of felt like that song was speaking to her. Well, towards the end of the show, in the South, they call it a testimony uh, or preaching. I, I don't preach, but I do kind of give a, uh, a, a, a heartfelt talk with the audience about real magic and that is the blessings that we have in our life our our health our friends family food shelter and freedom in america we have a lot to be thankful for even our worst day in life is better than no day we've been given a free life no matter where you think it came from we have a free life and all these blessings on top of it that create real magic and that's important for me to express to an audience i don't want to just be remembered for this guy who did this card act i want people to take something home with them and there's, there's an understanding, which all of you have heard, that people don't always remember what you did or what you said, but they remember the way you made them feel. And so when people leave the theater, it might be a week later, they won't remember the specific tricks, but I want them to remember the way they felt. And I want them to feel good and be excited and uh, appreciative of life itself. So this is what happened to this woman. She uh, drove home, ripped up the suicide note, flushed the pills, uh, joined a church, and God told her to become an artist. So she now paints, and uh, it just, it, it, that's probably the best thing that's ever come out of my career is that because of that song, well, because Vincent Van Gogh took his life, an artist took his life, Don McLean wrote the song about it, became my mother's favorite. I created the act for it. This woman saw it, did not take her life, and became an artist. Yeah, that is actually full circle. That is, like I said, no coincidences. But I will tell you, I'll I'll end this um, with this story. For me, for me, what have my my favorite story? I'll never forget. A lot of people, you know, after the show, we do a meet and greet, uh, which is funny. I got to tell you this: a meet and greet is when the audience comes up after the show, and you might sign an autograph or take a picture or visit with people and hear what they thought about the show at Disney World friend of mine that works at Disney, they said, we don't call that a meet and greet. We call it the love and shove. Mickey loves you next. Mickey loves you next. <laughs> so, funny. so we joke about the love and shove after the <laughs> show. But um, we're doing the meet and greet after the show, and this guy was kind of holding back, waiting for the audience to leave, and he had a young, probably three-year-old, four-year-old maybe son. He came up and he said, do you have a minute? And I said, of course. And he said, I got to tell you what happened. He said, um, it's not like my dad and I, he said, I took my son to see Ringling Brothers Circus about a month ago, and he loved it so much. It was like the first time that I saw him, just that sparkle in his eye, and just he, he just loved it so much. So when we took our vacation here and I saw the advertisement for your show, I thought, you know what? He's going to love a magic show. If he loved the circus, he's going to love a magic show. So he took his son to the show. The end of the show there, I do this Houdini style escape where I'm locked in chains in a, in a box and there's a huge 36 inch buzzsaw, you know, spinning and dropping closer and closer and closer and the music's even more intense. So the guy is telling me what happened. Um, 
the, the end of this trick, I, I vanish from the box and I appear in the audience. So when the blade drops in the box, I'm gone. The lights spin to the crowd and I'm standing among them in the audience. So, so the kid's watching the show and he's in his own seat next to his dad as the music started and he's getting kind of tense. The dad's watching him. Father told me, uh, uh, no offense, but I watched my son more than I watched you. And I love that because the parents, again, they're reliving it through the eyes of their child. So as this music's building, the kid is getting closer and closer to his dad. And pretty soon he's up on his lap and pretty soon he's covering his eyes and his little body's shaking. His dad said he was so scared that you were going to get hurt. And when the blade dropped in, his whole body just shuddered <laughs> and he just was just mortified that the magician had just been killed. And then bang, the lights come on and I'm standing, happened to appear right in front of them. <laughs> Beautiful. So the father told me this, his son looked at the stage and then looked up at me. And looked back at the stage and looked back at me. In his little mind, he was, uh, you know, recognizing the the fact that this is not possible. Some kids are so young, they don't know they're supposed to be amazed because they don't know what you can or can't do. Yeah. But this kid is at the age where he knows you can't be in two places at the same time. <laughs> he was way over there and now he's right here by me. So I went back to the stage, curtain call. Father told me this. He said, my son said, dad. And he said, What? And he said, he said, Ringling Brothers lies. And his father said, what do you mean? And he said, this, this is the greatest show on earth. Oh, my gosh. That's just, wonderful. I'm just so sobbing. I'll always, there will never, ever yeah. be a compliment better than a three-year-old kid. Oh I mean, gosh. just it's out beer. of the mouth it's of bears. Yeah. That was my favorite story. Oh, that's beautiful. Both of those stories, honestly, it's wonderful the impact you can have on somebody. And I know with magic, too, like you said, it may be scary to get into and in hard business and stuff, but it doesn't mean you can't be inspired by it. Everybody, there's got to be a next magician, uh, and you, you have to follow your dreams. And hopefully for, for a lot of people, it works out. And I'm one of those lucky, lucky ones. Uh you know, I'll be up on stage. Same thing in the moonlight. Every show I do, whether it's on tour here in Pigeon Forge, I look out in the crowd as I'm performing. I don't have to pay too much attention to what I'm doing because I've done so many shows. Okay. So I watch the audience a lot. They're my show. They think they're there watching me. I'm there watching them. They're my show. And sometimes <laughs> they're very entertaining. But I always I always scan the crowd and find that kid. I find I find the Terry in the audience who's got that twinkle in his eye, thinking, I want to be the next magician. And someday he will. And so it goes, and so it goes. That's fantastic. Yeah, fantastic. Well, great stories. I I, I really want to thank you for coming out and visit with us today. Oh, absolutely. Um, Taking time out of your, you know, brief time you got here. Trust so. me, this has been a, a highlight. This has been a highlight of my trip. I love St. Charles so much. And to be invited to do the, the podcast with you, this is really, uh, who'd have thought when I was a kid that, that I'd have enough to share and say to be involved with the museum. And just, Perfect. I find this an honor. So thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Terry. Yeah, yeah, we really appreciate it. It's, this is a great way for us to, to get the story out to the community and then have it available over and over again. And, and when people come looking for something a year or two or 10 from now, hopefully it still be findable. So yeah, I uh, really do appreciate it. <laughs> Um, Eric, you, you got anything else you want to talk about? Oh, or? no, no. I was just going to say, we'll have to just convert them to a different dish. Oh, yeah, <laughs> <get out>. right. <laughs> right. And while you're future. at it, I'm going to send you 3,000. <laughs> <laughs> That's going to be brutal. Now, okay. now there is one magic trick I can do over the, over the airwaves. I was going to ask you about that. If you had any, you could do yep. no audio. Yep. So, so here's my one trick with just audio. I'm going to disappear on the count of three. Ready? One, two, three. Three. Where'd he go? Where did he go? Holy moly. Oh, yeah, he left, left a vacuum in here, though. Folks, we're going to have to go out and look for uh, Terry because we <laughs> don't know what happened to him. Um, yeah, well, okay, so let's just wrap this up. I want to talk about a couple of things we've got going on right now. Uh, Eric has done a fantastic job with our special exhibit about Duquesne Operadio. Uh, for those of you that aren't familiar with the Duquesne Company, don't worry about it. Come here to the museum, spend about 45 minutes, and you will be a Duquesne expert. I was here the other day when some people who work at Duquesne came in. They were like little kids in a, in a, a Christmas story or something. They were they were ooh and an odd at everything they saw. Oh, he's got the jacket. He's oh my, you know. So, anyways, it's a great exhibit. It'll give everybody an introduction to that. Second thing is May first, we're going to have our second annual History Rocks event at the Rock and Ravioli. 
Um, that's on the first floor of the Arcata Theater building. That's at 6 p.m. on May 1st. Um, last year, remember, we had Elvis there. This year, Rick Saucedo. Um, this year, we're going to have a bluegrass band called um, Ransom Creek. I almost forgot it. Um, look forward to everybody come out. Last year, we sold that out. So it's a limited seating, so be sure you pay attention to that. Otherwise, uh, we've got some other stuff going on. We're in the middle of recording our music sessions with St. Charles Musicians. If you or anybody you know has been involved in music in any way, shape, or form, excuse me, here in St. Charles, come on down. We'd like to get to talk to you, a little bit of podcast thing like this, maybe have you play a song or two and, and put it in our uh, collection or our archive. And then later this year, we're going to have a nice show with all that available. So um, other than that, uh, again, if Terry was here, I would actually thank him for showing up again. It's really been a, a nice it was a nice time to hang out, and uh, Eric, uh, let's do it again soon, okay? Yeah, absolutely. All right, thanks. Have a good one, everyone. Thank you for listening to the St. Charles History Chronicle podcast. This content is copyright 2024, St. Charles History Museum, all rights reserved. Thank you to Jim Green for permission to use his music in the production of this podcast. Learn more about Jim at jimgreenmusic.com. Additional information on this episode and other podcast episodes is available at stcmuseum.org forward slash podcast.